Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're taking a look at this Napoleonic Wars era French Mutzig Model 1777 Flintlock Musket. The Model 1777 infantry musket was used by French troops and some early examples were also sent to North America to assist the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War with continued use through the Napoleonic Wars. This 1811 dated example would have likely been rushed into French service during the Napoleonic Wars. It's important to note here that the sling attached is a reproduction. To many of you, this is gonna look like a French Charleville Model 1777 musket, which gained notoriety here in the United States for being, in many regards, you know, a large assistance to the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War. And it's gonna look similar because it's just about the same thing coming out of a different arsenal. I bring this to you today because of my own personal curiosity in how a design that was developed in the late 18th century can still be in use 20, 30, sometimes 40 years later in a totally different war. We have these mechanisms, these flintlocks, being used and developed for one time period and being carried through and still being functionally relevant decades later. I find that just fascinating. Um, you know, when we think about human time, Along with that, a father could have used one of these muskets, and then his son could have used the same designed musket 30 years later in a different conflict, sometimes on a different continent. And I, I think that's kind of interesting that we have things in human history that are pervasive, just like this Model 1777. So going back here to the tip, we have an iron butt plate here and up on the tang we have a massive round-headed slotted screw holding this in place. And like many military arms for the period, we have a rounded toe that travels up through the wrist and, and eventually becomes the wrist here. Like many of these French military arms, we have a, a pronounced crest, not nearly as pronounced as we see in some different designs. There is a bit of drop here between our breech face and the heel of our butt stock here. Moving forward here to our lock and our lock mortise, we have a massive French style lock here. Again, these military arms for this period were designed to be workhorses, to be utilized and to be relied on. Many times now we think of, of flintlocks and muzzleloaders are, as being unreliable and slow, but at the time, these were state of the art pieces of equipment and they were expected to operate as such. We have military ordinance documentation from the time demanding that these flintlock mechanism operate and fire as many as 30 to 40 times without needing cleaning or repair, on the, especially on the field. I bring that up to contrast the modern notions we have, especially about these large military arms as being slow and clunky. While they aren't as refined as the American long rifle that many of us know and love, they still at the time were reliable workhorses meant to you know, extend kingdoms and uh, keep forces firing as long as possible. So we have a round faced lock here. We have a large hammer and frizzen accompanied by this removable brass pan here. This is something that I, I really find interesting on these military pieces because we've seen brass being used in naval service muzzleloaders for some time by the time we're seeing this developed. But we start to see brass pans being implemented here for the same reason as we see the brass being utilized in naval arms because of the brass's anti-corrosive properties. So we're using brass here in the pan literally where the explosion ignites, where ignition happens for our muzzleloader to increase durability and function. Underneath our pan, we have our Mutzig Arsenal marks denoting the place of manufacture for this arm in particular. And forward of that, we have our massive military style frizzen spring here, again, designed to be durable and long lasting. I'm going to place this back on half and full cock just so that you can hear the functionality here. How pronounced is that? That's incredible. 200, almost 250 years old, still works like a clock. Jumping to the top here, we have our rounded barrel tang. 
again, on many of these military muskets, you have a variation between models on what sights are included. We do have a brass blade front sight, but you'll notice here at the rear, we don't have any substantial rear sight on the breech end of our barrel. What we do have in the tang is a rather large tang screw. And while it is not on the same plane as our front sight for this piece, some say it can still be used as a guide, we'll say, as a rear sight or as a guide rear sight to index your breech and your muzzle end when firing. Now, we can get into the particulars of linear warfare and why that may or may not matter as much, but nevertheless, that is what is said about it. Uh, on the tang here, we have our number 1777 engraved or stamped in here. The model 1777 does feature some slight flats in the barrel here at the breech. We have a top barrel flat that begins at the tang and really concludes with the frizzen before it becomes the rounded barrel. I say this because on our side plate side here, we have two barrel proof marks. We have one at the breech and then we have our 1811 stamped here on this left barrel flat. I don't want to skip over our trigger guard for this piece. We have a long extended iron trigger guard here. We have one screw back here at the end, about halfway between our trigger and our toe. Our tang bolt or our barrel tang bolt comes through and intersects, locking in our trigger plate, connecting these two pieces. And then the front end of our trigger guard is held in with a trigger guard pin that goes through the stock and terminates inside of our lock mortise. Like many military arms for the period, I want to note the general size of this piece. It is meant to be a workhorse, and that is seen in what could be considered excess wood still left on the piece. While it is still artful in design, in my opinion, we do see a lot of wood here along our barrel channel, about a quarter of an inch back here behind our third barrel band. Durability was important, so we see a thickness and a size in our lock in our trigger guard, in our butt plate, that same level of durability has translated to our stock with its size thickness. Moving forward of our lock and trigger guard here, we have three barrel bands here. These barrel bands have a spring-loaded lever to their front here, allowing us to depress that lever and remove the barrel band for maintenance and cleaning of these barrels. Military ordnance for the time varies from country to country, but many times at the end of the day or at a regimented time, military service members were required to disassemble their arms and completely clean them, keeping a bright, shiny finish on them as mandated by their commanding officers and military ordnance for the time. Barrel bands are a crucial element to that because they increase the durability and make it easier to disassemble these arms. Predating the barrel band, which you can see externally here, we would have what we called barrel pins. These barrel pins would be a small pin that would go through the wood stock, intersect with a barrel key, a soldered piece of metal with a hole or slot in it underneath the barrel, and that pin would then go through that stock, through that key, and out through the other side of the stock. Those pins would tie the barrel to the stock in multiple places along the barrel channel here to keep the muzzleloading arm as one piece. Barrel bands came along and really changed that design. The pins, while durable, predating barrel bands, were known to cause splinters or fractures in the stocks and overall didn't give you a lot of intersection between your barrel and your stock. The barrel band is an external, rather heavy means to connect our barrel and our stock together. Less likely to blow out the stock or break the stock in the manner that we saw with pins in use. And we see barrel bands like this being used for nearly 100 years, or just a little bit more, after the advent of this particular model and other models from other countries in the late 18th century. So it was a design that worked and it's a design that carried on for quite a long time after its development. So we have three of these barrel bands. Our middle barrel band here has our accompanying sling swivel here. So as you can see in this reproduction sling, we have our sling connecting up here with this barrel band. 
which is held in by that spring lever there, connects back here to our trigger guard. So we have two rather hard mounts for our sling here, making for a durable means to carry this arm on long journeys. Our front barrel band features two bands on the top and a single connecting band at the bottom. Our rear band here on our front barrel band has a brass blade front sight. This brass blade gives us a contrasting metal for the marksman or the shooter using this arm to look for when shooting. The barrel and these bands, believe it or not, when shooting, can kind of blend together, making it hard to realize what you're looking at, what you're shooting at. The contrast of the yellow brass compared to the white uh, iron gives you something to look for. It gives you a contrasting color for your eye to look for to know what direction you're shooting at. Rotating this to the underside, we can see our undermounted bayonet lug here on the bottom of our muzzle as it extends past our barrel band. So a French military issue bayonet would index with that bayonet lug and be held there in place to use this arm as a melee weapon if the situation came to that. Aside from holding our barrel and stock together, these barrel bands also act as ramrod pipes to hold our ramrod to the stock so that it cannot be lost when traveling. On more civilian arms for the period, we would see what we'd call ramrod pipes, which would be external metal pipes attached to the underside of this stock. These pipes would help index our ramrod. But in military arms, especially into the late 18th and into the early 19th century, like this is an example from, we see the metal barrel bands being multi-purpose, being utilized to hold those ramrods in place. Flipping around to the other side for you to check out here, the other side of our forestock here is not that much different uh, compared to our lock plate side that we've just looked at. You can see the reverse side of our barrel bands. You'll notice that the barrel band release uh, is not visible on this side. It's all kept on our lock plate side. On the opposite side of our lock here, we have what we call our side plate mortise or side plate area. We have an extended area of wood shaped here in the same shape that we saw on our lock plate side. So we have matching motifs, we'll call them, on either side here. Side is, this side is called the side plate side because we have this metal plate here on the side, opposite of our lock side. We have two large flat-headed slotted bolts here. These bolts, both the upper and this forward bolt, index with threads in our lock. And these bolts hold the lock to the stock and to the barrel. So these bolts here just clamp this entire breech assembly together, keeping everything tight and giving it some structural strength. When we load and prime a flintlock arm like this one, we have a lot of explosive energy in this lock area. By containing the entire area with these compressive bolts, we generally have increased odds of keeping everything together. Becomes important in flintlock priming especially because any separation between our flintlock pan and the lock itself can lead to powder getting down between the barrel and the lock. That powder can later ignite, blowing the lock clean off the stock and damaging the mortise and the muzzle loader itself as well as the marksman or the shooter using the arm. Stepping back here through the wrist of the stock, we have something different than we've seen in other military arms that we've looked at, especially this week. We have a bit of a recessed area cut here in the stock. This is a cheek recess, allowing for a little bit increased comfort on the shooter's part or the marksman's part. That recess allows the shooter to get further into the stock lining their eye or getting their eye in line more with our rear tang bolt, the direction of our barrel, and ultimately the front sight here. Many military arms that we see before and after this piece don't necessarily feature any kind of support or change in the stock. Many times they'll be the same on the right and the left side, but we see something in this model 1777 and in model 1777s in general with that cheek recess being cut in that stock. All in all, a really neat piece of flintlock era muzzle loading history here. 
Military arms don't necessarily have the adornment that civilian arms do from the period, but I think they're special because of their total utility and how long they could function and how long through time they, they really worked. I mean, we have models like this and models predating this being used in the 1770s all the way up through and seeing use in the Napoleonic era. I think that's really neat. Even today in the 21st century, we don't see a lot of designs and manufactured goods standing the test of time and still functioning 30 years later. So it's always fascinating to see something that was made by hand, limited tooling compared to what we have today, standing the test of time, state of the art at the time, and, uh, and functioning as long as it did. I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to watch this here today. If you'd like to learn more about this or any other antique arms, I encourage you to visit the Rock Island Auction Company YouTube channel to learn more. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.